Wow. It's good to see everybody this evening. Thank you for coming. Hallelujah. We've had a busy day. So if it seems like we're, we are. So that's all I'm going to say about that. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to start this evening by um, bringing a, a little message this morning out of Genesis. Genesis chapter... Eight. I want to set the stage on this, and that is when God, when God had, when God had the flood to come and wipe out the world because of the wickedness of man. Before he had, before Noah got off of the ark. God had already made arrangements for the offering that he would prepare. When Noah, when Noah got off the ark in uh, Genesis chapter 8, God told him all the water had, had gone down. He got, gets off of the ark. He looks around. The first thing he does, Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, and Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and he offered burnt offerings on the altar and the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done but if you think about it, a couple chapters before, when he told Noah to get on the ark, he told him to get on, and how many, how many animals did he want him to pick up? Of every animal, how many? Two. But if you look over in, in uh, Genesis chapter 7, let's read verse 2 and 3. <clears throat> Actually, let's read one through three. Now, this is before the flood. So before Noah can offer an offering unto the Lord, God has already made provision for him to have extra animals to bring his sacrifice and to bring his offering to the Lord. He's basically provided himself an offering. Listen to chap, uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse uh, 1 through 3. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Now listen to this. Of every clean beast. Now a clean beast is one that you sacrifice. If you got a snake, it's not a clean beast. If you got a dove, it's a clean beast. Make sense? Uh, or a or an ox or something. There are certain things that you could sacrifice as an offering that were like with Abel. He was allowed to bring the lamb, but when Cain brought his vegetables, it wasn't, it wasn't good. So God had already established what was a good offering and what was not. And so because he knew that he would need to make an offering, on the ark he had him to... Verse 2, of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. So if you had oxen, you wouldn't just have Mr. and Mrs. Ox. You'd have seven Mr. and Mrs. Oxes. Okay? Because several of them are going to be used right away to kill, and that would the oxen would never be any more upon this earth. You remember, you only had two when you got out of there. Mr. and Mrs. Armadillo. Once one of them died, it was over. So they had to be very careful, and so he had to pack extra, if you will. And the point I'm making, it says, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female. So here you have a husband and a wife. You have the male and the female, so they can procreate. 
and of each one of them, now in, in this case, he has seven pairs, not just seven guys, because that's not going to be good, not seven females, but seven pairs, every, every one with his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by twos, the male and the female. So you can see that he added some extra clean ones. Why? So that they could offer them. Okay? Of every fowl of the air by sevens, the male and the female fowl, of every seed alive, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. And so what struck me about this was that as God was getting on the ark, God in getting Noah on the ark, he was telling two, two hippos, two elephants, two pelicans, oh, get seven of these. Because he's already thinking that when we get off this ark, you're going to need something to sacrifice. And so he, as my wife would say, he was proactive, thinking ahead, and um, preparing for him to have something to sacrifice. And the first thing, you think about this. I, I, was, I was looking today, and I, I don't know if this is correct, but I believe it is. <clears throat> Noah was on the ark for one year and ten days. Because he got on the ark. No, it, it only rained for 40 days and 40 nights. But then it was the water was on the earth for 150 days, and then they sent out the raven, they sent out the dove, and it circled around a while, and then a long time later, he starts blowing on the ground, and it takes a long time to go to Mount, from Mount Everest down to sea level and then dry out on top of that. It's not a big mud puddle. But the Bible says in chapter, in, in uh, Genesis chapter 7, <clears throat> that Moses was 600 years old, two months and 17 days when the water started. I believe that's in there because I just heard it. So, and then in chapter 8, it finishes after all of the birds sending out the dove and it comes back and Mount Ararat and that all that by saying that on the 601st year, on the 20 and 7th day, it was dry. And he went out, he, he got out of the ark. So you've got 600 years old, two months and 17 days, and 601 year, be a year later, the second month and the 27th day. So if you do the math, it's, it's basically 375 days. And I don't know what 375 means, but it's probably a good number. But it, it's how long he was on the ark and they were cooped up. So when you think 40 days, 40 nights, that was just how long it rained. Okay. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10. We read... Nine verse, yeah, nine verse nine. As it is written, he, being God, has dispersed abroad. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. Verse 10. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Here's the verse that talks about God ministering seed to the sower. And we see it walked out in Noah's life. He knew that Noah would offer an offering when he got off because he knew Noah's heart. He said, I've seen your heart, you're righteous before me. He knew that he would be righteous and that he would offer those back to him. And so he gave seed to the sower. If I know Debbie's going to need an offering and, and I'm God, I would give her an offering so that she could sow it into my work. Does that make sense? Now, if I knew that she'd stash it and siphon it off and squander it, 
I wouldn't give it to her. Okay, does that make sense? If you're a sower, God gives you seed. If you're one who's conniving and doing your own thing and you can't be trusted, you've seen where God give, give, give the talents, the ones that did well, got more, and they were added to because they had been faithful. It's the same thing. When you're faithful and in your sowing, God will give you more. And once you've showed yourself faithful, he'll give even more. And that which this other guy didn't do anything with, he'll transfer to your account because this guy over here is slothful, but you've been found faithful. So as we are, as we are found faithful, God will continue to provide more to us and for, and for us. Because like the old adage, if he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. God doesn't send us provision so that we can become a, a, a pond. He puts money through us. He puts provision through us because then we're a conduit to give to others. And a long time ago, I, I'm a, a preacher, uh, Kenneth Copeland, made a very interesting statement that I've put in my heart. He says, if you're a pipeline for the Lord, you'll flow, he'll flow all kinds of money and provision through you. And then he made the adage, and that your pipeline will always be full. So I thought, if I'm the pipeline, I'll never miss a meal because I can get a bite as it's going through. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. The Bible says you don't muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, which means if you're out there working and slaving and, and you're going round and round grinding the, say you're on a grinding mill and you're, you're an ox and you're going round and round and round and round and, and your feet are grinding out the corn. They put the corn down and you step on it. You're crushing it. That's how they ground it. There's a Bible verse that says, do not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. In other words, if, if you've got an ox out there, God is good with the ox getting a bite every now and then. And then Paul makes the statement. He said, does this, is God care just about oxen, or is that supposed to mean, is there a bigger picture where if you've got a, a minister that's ministering, is it wrong if he eats too? No. Because he is the ox that's shredding out the corn. It's okay for him to grab a bite every now and then and eat from that which God supplies. Does that make sense? So as, as, as we go forward, let's, let's keep in mind that God gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So we're, we're good at eating, but, but are we good at sowing? Okay? And if we want God to pour provision through us, then we need to show ourselves faithful so he can say, you know what, when I give it to him, they get it to where I tell them to go. And then God is not scared to give you larger amounts of money, larger amounts of blessing and provision, because he knows he can trust you. Give it away. Ah, uh, that was mine. No, if it's not yours and you're, you're good with giving it away, God will flow stuff through you like you wouldn't believe. We call that a distribution center because it comes in and then pfft, it's gone. It's like it's not yours. And we are all stewards of what God has provided for us. So... Um, as, as the service goes this evening, if you want to give into the offering, feel free. Um, make all checks payable to Spirit of Life. Uh, we also take credit card and cash. So the offering envelopes are there. Um, and just feel free to give, and we will say an offering declaration at the close of the service and bless all that has been given. Hallelujah. Sister? Yes, it was. Thank you, Steve. Go back to Genesis, um, where he was at Genesis 7. When I want to go right back a little bit before that into Genesis 6 and kind of go into where, where he was at. In Genesis 6, this is God talking and telling him, you know, make yourself an ark. And I want to start in verse 18. And God says, Behold, 
Oh, but I will establish my covenant, my promise, my pledge with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wives, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh found on the land, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Um, skip down to verse 21. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten, and you shall collect and store it up, and it shall serve as food for you and for them. Verse 22. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him to do. And, you know, there's people always ask us. In fact, you know, usually there's at least one or two in my office every month. And that's just in my office. Most, you know, people catch us all the time out and about saying, how do you do what you do? And, and why, you know, and how, how, can I, how can I start a ministry? How can I do this? And, you know, my first thing is, well, just do it. And my second word is, Pastor Yonggi Cho says, pray and obey. Well, it seems really glib, but that's really the basis of it. Pray and obey. And, and you know, God told Moses to build an ark. And he gave him all the directions. But if Noah had not cut down the first tree, the ark would never have been built. Okay? If, um, I, just, I just keep thinking, you know, what does it take? What does it take to do what God tells us to do? First of all, it takes knowing that you know that you know that you know that God told you. And that's hearing God's voice. And on that, you should be practicing every day. I mean, it's easy to practice. Go into your closet first thing in the morning and say, Lord, what do you want me to wear? And then listen. You know, you can always ask, but you got to listen. And then put it on. And then watch what happens that day. Somebody will come up and say, I love your shirt. Or they'll come up and say, you know, I was, that color is ministering to me today. Um, the one that, that hit me one time, uh, Elaine and I were at Bethel in uh, Reading. And I was wearing this scarf, and I know the Lord had told me to wear it, and I was just messing with it, and I was like, it's hot, and I don't want it. And, and you could hear, I mean, Elaine heard me griping all day. Oh, why am I wearing this scarf? No, 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 no. And we were sitting on, we were sitting outside at a table, and these two girls came up, just ran up. We're doing a treasure hunt. And the Lord told me I'd find a girl with a scarf around her neck. And I'm thinking, and if I hadn't been messing with a stupid pink scarf all day long, <laughs> You know, we wouldn't have gotten this word. You know, so, so go into your closet. Lord, what do you want me to wear today? And watch. Those, when you go to a gathering, you can start seeing a lot of people wearing the same color clothes. And you're thinking, ah, I got it. I hit it. You know, little things. Practice hearing God's voice. But you have to hear God's voice. You have to know it's God's word. And then you have to do it. Because you pray and obey. You know, the, the, the widow, the Shunammite lady, uh, she wasn't a widow at the time, but the Shunammite woman, she kept seeing the man of God walk past her house. And she decided, hey, let's build a room. She built a room. She put a table and a lamp and a chair in there. But Elijah, Elijah if he hadn't have been passing by that way every time, Elisha, then he would never have receive the room. So not only did she have to obey, but the prophet had to obey. And because she obeyed and the prophet obeyed, then suddenly this child was born. You know, there's a lot. I mean, she had 14 miracles to her name. More than any other person in, recorded in the, in the scriptures. Why? Because she built a room. She obeyed. So, so there's a few things. You pray, you obey, you keep the vision in front of you at all times. You, you don't waver. You bring others, the Lord, you ask the Lord to bring others along beside you. Because if you're trying to do it alone, it's really tough. But when you do it with other people, when you're down, they pick you up. When they're down, you pick them up. 
Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, Two are better than one because they have good, a more satisfying reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two are lying together, then they have warmth. But how can one be, one be warm alone? And though a man may prevail against him who is alone, two will, with, with, will withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So when you have people around you to carry you and help you go through this vision, you know, that's why we say don't be a, you, you, there's no lone rangers in the kingdom. And, and if, you, if you're thinking that you're a lone ranger, then you need to look around and say, why do I feel this way? Who, is, who has the same vision that I am? Who, who's going the same way that I'm going? Who can encourage me? Who can I encourage? And, you know, Noah, think about Noah. Go back to what Steve was talking about. Noah, God told Noah the vision. But his sons and his wife and his son's wives carried him through that vision. Noah did not build the ark all by himself. And, and can you imagine him saying, well, the Lord told me this for 100 years. His son's like, why am I going to work today? Can I go fishing? No, the Lord said, drive another nail. Are you sure God told you this? No, drive another nail. You know, he, he had his family in the midst of an evil generation, of evil, evil world. He had his family to help him. And even with us, we have family to help. Our family might not be our blood, brother and sister, but, we, but it's each other. That's why when we come together in a gathering and we welcome the earthly saints, so I welcome each of you, it's not just words coming out. It's really, truly a welcome because each of us has a vital part in the kingdom. And each of us have a vital part in, the, in, in this region, in the state, wherever you're from, when, it, when there's gatherings from people f coming from everywhere. We have to have each other. You know, Ian Johnson's coming next week from New Zealand. You're thinking, well, what does, you know, what does New Zealand have with us? Why do we have to be connected? Well, do you know that the most earthquakes right now are in Oklahoma and New Zealand? So for some reason, God's connecting. It's our job to connect. It doesn't, it's not our job to ask. It's our job to connect. And so when we're coming together and we're like, you know, we welcome you. We welcome the anointings that you have and the callings that you have. It's not just a verbal exercise. This is truth. It's important. And, and, it's, and even if you say, I'm not doing anything except sitting in the chair. No, you don't understand. You don't see what's going on around you. There's frequencies in you. There's anointings in you that it connects with others. And it's, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like big rainbows coming together. If you only have blue all the time, it gets boring. But when you put the green with it and the yellow and the red, it makes beautiful rainbows. And rainbows are promise. And God gives us promises every time we come together. So it's important. It's important. We're not just, we're not just saying it. You know, when you say just do it, you have to do something. You know, we might, if, you're, if you're called to a ministry, do something. <laughs> volunteer. You know how Steve and I, we volunteered for all these conferences and all these different speakers for years. For years and years and years. And I mean, how do we connect, get connected with some of these people that are here? Because we volunteered at their conference. We worked their book tables. We were standing beside them when they were signing books. You know, we, he, catching for them. Um, doing modesty clause. We did everything. You know, and, and we sowed. And now we're having prophecies saying you will never lack for volunteers. Why? Because we sowed our volunteer time. You know, if you're looking for it to be a minister, you better be sowing volunteer because you definitely need volunteers. We cannot do what we do without everybody coming together. It doesn't work. We have to have volunteers. And so what happened? We volunteered. 
we sowed that. And Keith Moore was the first one that told us and said, um, or was he was preaching, where was he listening to him, and he said, I sowed 20 years of volunteer hours into Kenneth Hagin. Now in his church, he said, we have so many volunteers, we have to turn them away because we don't have enough places for the volunteers. He said, we've never lacked. I'm thinking, you mean we can do more than just money? Yeah. So volunteer hours. You want to have a dress shop? Go volunteer. Go do an internship. You know, back in the day, we used to have apprentices. People would apprentice themselves to different places to learn the trade. But that's also a type of sowing. You're sowing your time. You're re reaping the knowledge. But then when you start getting your shop, then the apprentices will come to your shop. Same difference. You know, we're not just sowing just money. We're sowing everything. You sitting in the chair right now, you're sowing of your time. You're sowing even of your anointing. So, so we need to change our mind our mindsets and see what's happening in the spirit realm. It's not just a paycheck. If you're called into the marketplace, you say, I want my own shop. Go buy you a rack. You want to be a CPA? Go get you a calculator. Put it before your eyes. Do something. It doesn't have, you don't have to go start the business today, but you need to take a step. Every day, what step take in that direction? Yeah, when we bought our first chair, we were over in the other area, because you know, all that was open. We bought one chair, and Steve set it in the middle of the room, and we would sit in that chair. And then he would move it over to the other place and say, thank you, Lord, that this is going to be full of chairs. Hallelujah. And then he'd move it to the other part of the room and sit in it. And I was like, Steve, what are you doing? But he had one chair. It was one of those brown chairs. And he said, one chair, and he'd move it all over the place. Now we have enough chairs that we have stuff stacked in the back. Well, not too many because we've used them, but yeah. And we're going to use them. But, you know, do one thing. You know, if all you can buy is one chair, you bought one chair. Our first service, and we, we, we had one chair and everything else we borrowed. But we had chairs, praise God. Yes. There was a... Um, a quote I saw the other day it says if your ship doesn't seem to be coming in swim out and meet it you know, do something do something because God you know God is saying he's like I'm giving you talents well those talents could be money those talents could be talent I mean like art what we consider our giftings well the one that was was not faithful was the one that hid and didn't try and multiply it now, if you think about it, the one with the five talents and the one with the two talents, to multiply those talents, they had to give them away. They couldn't hold on to them and have them multiply. They had to invest them somehow. So they had to take a risk somehow. Hallelujah. Now, the risks are hard to take. And sometimes we sit back there in the office and cry and say, I don't know if I can take this risk. That happened right before the service. <laughs> oh, good. But, we did. but we did. And it's going to be good. Amen. And, and so, you know, why, why did God say that when the last picture was hung, get the rest of the building? Well, because that day, somebody else wanted to rent the rest of the building. Does it look like we could afford it? No. Do we think every month can we afford it? No. But God's been faithful. Because God's will is his bill. And he'll be faithful. But you have to take the step. He can never be faithful to you if you're not willing to step out. So do what you need to do. I mean, Johnny is into, yeah, his head pops up. The media. And, you know, Johnny has, and I'm not, I'm not using you, Johnny, sorry. But he, I'm not really, but he, he has... You know, he's gone to all these classes and he has all these certificates to be all this, 
media producer and video and, and he loves video and audio and all this stuff. And he's been with us since day one, but he's had to take, you know, a little, little board until we could get a bigger board. And then we're like, well, we need cameras. Well, the cameras that would really make it pop. I mean, if you watch the videos, it's like, yeah, whatever. But the cameras that really made it pop was the switchers and all this stuff. Well, we don't have that kind of funds right now. But what did he do? He got an iPad to do Periscope. And what did he do? He went and bought this little camera to do the little things. He started where he could. Hallelujah. That's not where he knows he's going to end up. He knows he's going to end up with all these fancy cameras and switchers and be able to really show his stuff. Yes. But you start where you're at, yes. at all times. And that's, that's what I'm trying to say. You know, we have to know what God is telling us to do. Yes. And then start where, he, where we can. If he's telling you that he wants you to, to, to preach, well, have you studied? What about a sermon? If I were to say, okay, you're called to preach, get up here tonight, would you be able to do that? You know, oh, I'm called to teach. Okay, if you're called to teach, if I told you right now, here's a verse, teach it, would you be able to do that? And you think, oh, that's crazy. No, that's not crazy. I've had to do it more than once. Okay, so you just do it. When, when you're called to do something, you do the next thing. You study to show yourself approved and you're ready in season and out. Amen. You know, it, Dale, he's, he's a chef. And there's times I'm like, Dale, I know we have to have a meal tonight, but I also know that we don't have the money in the account. And he says, it's okay. You got this and this and this and I can whip this together. And he has a whole meal because he's a chef. But it's, but, but it's by practice. If he was called to be a chef and never cooked, he would go and say, look at me, like, like me. Oh, um, yeah, water, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he said, I don't know water burnt. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. He, you know, you practice. You, <laughs> John is cracking up. You practice. You do what God's called you and you do it. You know, and you do it with excellence, you know, and everything excellence. If you're called to be in, in the office or, or like, like we do with the minutes, we have, we have uh, postcards that we send out. You guys seen them? It doesn't cost any less to send out a postcard with no spell check or no, no mis mistakes on it as it does to have all these mistakes and all these typos and funky things on it. It doesn't cost anything more or less, except for our reputation and our excellence. You know, if you're, if you're called to be a CPA and you want to, and you want to make a, a, a business card and, well, actually, if you were called to be a secretary and you wanted to make a business card, sorry, there's a gym. Um, no, I'm not. Oh, that's a topaz. Uh, anyway, there was a gym. Um, if you were called to be a secretary and you made a business card, but everything was off-centered and, and typos and, and one font this way and one font that way, and it looks like a two-year-old did it, you're not going to get the job. And people don't say, why would I offer you my business if you're not, if, if you don't even care about your business, why would you care about mine? Excellence is an important thing. So the Bible says, in everything that you do, do as unto the Lord. And so we need, we need to step up and do that. Um, and most of all, be who you are. God created you unique for a purpose. If God's called you to do something he didn't call you to be just like the next person. He called you to be unique. He called you to be who you are for a reason. Because that is perfect in his eyes. So don't try to be, you know, I'm a, I'm a missionary kid. I'm a preacher's kid. So we always go into all these 
ministers' meetings. And you go to these ministers' meetings, and all these old pastors are there with the suits and ties, and all these young pastors are there trying to mimic the old pastors with their suits and the ties. And then you see them preaching that way. Barbie did it really good. God. Yeah. She went to Southeastern. I went to Southwestern. Same difference. You know, you, they try and mimic those ahead, those uh, before. And, and to be honest, those, there are people in, in those compositions that try to make you become them. And, and you have to say, I'm not called to be a mini you. I'm called to be a mini him. God created me in, my, in his image, in his likeness for a purpose. He created me unique. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned before him, before us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, live in the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. See, we are God's workmanship, his masterpiece. We are created for a purpose the way he created you. Okay, there's no, there's no mistakes. God does not make mistakes, especially not with you because you're the apple of his eye. You're important to him. So the only mistake that we see is when we compare ourselves to somebody else. And then the problem is ourselves. You can take what is good, that what you see somebody else doing that's good, but then do what God tells you to do with it. Okay, there's, I mean, we, we're, we're all into the cloud of witnesses and we honor the cloud of witnesses. We understand that they've plowed the field and we take, we, we study their lives so we can take what's good and we also study their lives so we can not do what's bad. But on the same token, we become, our, we become who God's called us to be. Now, how many times has God told, or not God, how many times have others have come in here and say, you've got to be a church. You really need to be a church. If you were a church, it'd be better. Uh, no, God did not call us to be a church. Because of the region that we're in, because of the ministry that we're called to be, we need to be, in, we need to be a Switzerland, a neutral place, so that everybody can come together from every tribe, every stream, every church, and then take the anointing back. Bring the anointing that they have here, too. It's not just a matter of taking it back, but bringing what they have here. And then... We have to be who we called to be. Don't, and, and, and don't separate your giftings from your job. I need to quit. Um, sorry, I can keep going. I can, but don't separate your giftings from your jobs. You know, if you're, if you're um, a, a cook, use those giftings in your cooking. Hallelujah. You know, the first person that ever recognized my prophetic gifting the first person that ever recognized my prophetic gifting was my non-Christian, non-practicing Catholic boss. And he would say, he, would, he, would, he, was, he was a vice president over all the, all the United States doing the general managers hiring them. And so he would make them, it, one of his requirements was that they would come into the office. So they'd fly in from Alaska and all over the place. And he would walk them didn't, didn't say a word, just walked them beside my desk and take them in his office, shut the door and come back and he said, okay, Debbie, what did you see? And I'm like, what's that? It wasn't until years after I'm like, oh, he's seeing the prophetic gifting in me that I didn't know I had. And the church sure didn't know I had because I was in a denominational church. But anyway, so, but you use those for God's glory. You know, you can, you, if you're in nursing, you can use your healing gifts in nursing. You know, if you're in a business, you can use your prophetic gifting in business. If you're, if you're doing um, stocks and bonds, you better use your giftings in the other. Okay, so don't separate your job from your giftings. God created you unique. He created you for a purpose. He, put the, he hardwired you. The reason he hardwired you for a reason. And, and all we have to do is pray and obey. 
All we have to do is just do it. Every day, take a step. Every day, take a step. You were going to tag team. Okay. Anyway, so every, every day, go for what the Lord wants you to do. Because God has a purpose. He created us so perfect in his image. We're in his image. In his likeness. And any time we put that image and that likeness down, we're putting God down. But every time you step into how God created you for your purpose, for your passion, then you're praising and glorifying God. So we need to start opening our eyes and seeing what God is wanting us to do and wanting us to see and then do it. Don't say that I'm going to do this tomorrow or next year or when I get the money. We laugh at young people who get married and say, well, well we have the next five years planned out and, and, and our babies won't come until the year four and a half and they'll not be born on September the you know, 12th and at 5 p.m. And we all laugh and say, yeah, we'll see how that works out. Well, same thing when God gives us a baby in the spirit realm. It might not be what we think. It might not be in our timing. And it might not even be, you know, we, we're thinking, oh, yeah, we're going to have a boy first and a girl and a boy and the girl. And, and no, it might be all mixed up. But God knows better. And God has a plan. And his plans never fail. And he's given us seed to sow. Money. He's given us our passion. He's given us our time. He's given us our mouth. He's given us our ability. And everything that we do unto God is a seed sown. Everything we do unto God. Do you hear that, unto God? If you're just doing it because, ah, I think I should, or ah, maybe. No, it's just like it's going down the drain. But everything you do unto God is a seed planted. And you will reap and harvest if you faint not. And we are not those who faint. We are not those who draw back. We are those who put our hands to the plow and look ahead and we keep going. We are those who God has called us to be for a purpose and a time and a season. And this is the time and this is the season. And God says, I've heard why not now and why not us so many times. I'm saying now is the time and now is the people and I've called you and now it's going to be you. It's going to be you who will listen to me and will follow my voice. I will show myself strong on your behalf. And I will cause the, the, the harvest to come up. And I will cause those that the canker worm has eaten and that the locust has eaten, eaten to spring up. We don't know how, but they come up again. And we'll not have the harvest that we planted that we have not reaped. We're going to have the harvest that had died up on the straw, on the, on the stalk. It's going to come back. You're going to see the, de the dead living. You're going to see your dead harvest living again. You're going to say, rise and be healed. And it's not going to be the dead person. It's going to be the dead harvest. Because now is the time and this is the season that we're going to start and we're going to keep going. It's not looking back anymore, but it's going forward. It's not saying, Why, when will it happen? Will it be next week or will it be two weeks from now? Will it be a month? No, the Lord says now is a time when the reaper will overtake the sower. Now is a time. Now is a season. And the Lord says we will overcome and we will be the ones that God has called us to be. So let's all stand up and praise God and worship him because his word is true. We worship you, Lord. We honor you. We give you all the glory, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, let's surrender. Hallelujah. Come on, love him, love him. Surrender. We surrender to you, Lord. 
Mariando Sikande. Oh, God, we hunger after you. I hunger after you, God. Oh, Rishikando Riande. We love you, God. I love you. I adore you, God. I adore you, God. I adore you. Holy God. You are holy. You are holy. We surrender. I surrender. Oh. I surrender. Rishikando Riande.
Sing high. 
Release, release your praises to him. Release your praise. Release your sound. Release the movement. Raise you off the ground. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Come on.
reach and reach and lay hold. Jesus, 
Jesus, you are worthy of our praise, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Jesus, you are high and lifted up, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Jesus, you are high and lifted up, Lord Jesus, we Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you are worthy Jesus. of our praise, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you are closer than a friend, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, our Jesus, coming King, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus.
Praise Him, praise His name. 
about Jehoshaphat and how they were faced with their enemies coming in and they first of all they fell on their faces and they worshiped and they worshiped and then they said if you believe in the Lord your God established believe in his prophets and you will prosper and that word established means to be nursed to be taken care of. Come on. So if you believe in the Lord, it's going to be you're going to be taken care of. He's going to take care of you. He's going to nurse you like a mother would nurse a child. He's going to take care of you. And if you believe as prophets, you're going to have you're going to prosper. And that word in the Hebrew is S O L A M. Salom. It means to prosper, to prevail to be victorious but then it says the next day he got up and after he consulted the people because the people have to all agree come into unity he appointed singers and as they sang and praised him in their priestly garment and see we are in our priestly garment in heaven you will see those who are, have their garments of salvation. And then you will see those who have their coats of righteousness. And this is our priestly garment. And as we're praising and we're standing before him, and it says, and they said, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Praise ye the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Praise ye the Lord, for his mercy endures yeah. forever. And as they praised him, the Lord sent ambushments against their enemies. So as we praise him, the Lord takes care of us. And the Lord prospers us. And he sets ambushments against our enemies. But we are in our priestly garments before the Most High God, worshiping Him and praising Him and telling the whole universe, to telling all creation, praise ye the Lord, for His mercy endures forever. Psalms chapter 44, verse 3. It 
it says, for they got not the land in possession by their own sword. Talking about the Israelites, looking back in retrospect. You know, they had to show up for the battles. They had to be there. They had to do what God says. But at the end of the day, they got not the land in possession by their own sword. Psalm 44, chapter th verse 3 says, Neither did their own arms save them. You know, we can do what we can do, but at the end of the day, it's got to be God's arm that saves yes. us. Neither did their own by their own sword, neither did their own arms save them, but, but thy right hand, talking about God, thy right hand and thine arm, and by the light of thy countenance. So they got not the land of Canaan by their own sword. They didn't go in there. It was their own sword, but it wasn't. They could see a difference when God was with them with their sword. Amen. It's like we talked about with Moses and Aaron and her, you know, they prevailed when their hands were up and when they got discouraged or despondent and they weren't praising when they weren't focused on God, then they were back to their own doing it in their own flesh and their outcome was equally as miserable. I think about Gideon. Gideon said, who am I to deliver the people? And God set him up against the Midianites. And they, they showed up with 30,000 people and went after them. And God said, that's too many. Send everyone that's scared home. And all the scared people went home. And they, had, they were down to believe it was 10,000. And then God took them down to the river and said, everyone get a drink. And he showed Gideon that those that lapped the water like a dog, they needed to go to the house because they weren't watching for the enemy. They were just, had their face in the water where the other ones were looking around. They were kneeling down and they had bent and they were, they were prepared. And everyone that went home and left them 300 people against this huge bunch of Midianites. And Gideon was concerned. And God had him go to the enemy camp. And he went up next to the tent, him and his buddy. And one buddy had just had a dream. And he said, I just dreamed this, about this big mountain and this cake of bread rolled down the mountain and just clobbered our tents, rolled right over us and just wiped us out. And the other guy was an interpreter and said, that just means we're about to get blown away. And fear was in the hearts of the enemy. You see God at work. And so God mobilized him and said, get jars, get a torch, get a shofar, get a, get a trumpet, and, and we're going to surround the enemy. And they did. It was midnight. And when they got, when they got the, all the signal, they all broke their jars, and the lights all shone, and they sh hit their trumpet. Only God could come up with this kind of a program and it scared the enemy so bad they came out of sleeping and they you know when you're waking up you don't know what day it is what's going on they started killing each other and they wiped each other they wiped the whole crew out this is what it means when it says they got not the victory by their own sword by their own victory God showed them like in, when Debbie was talking about they said wait until you hear the rustling in the mulberry trees and God said ambushments and it was it was it was taken care of so in all in all of our ways we need to trust in the lord it's he that goes before us and wins our battles like debbie says we've got to suit up and show up and we've got to do the next thing but when we take one step god takes two and three and five and there's no telling we can be at the right place at the right time and god can really minister but if we're holed up, sitting in our little closet, scared to death, nothing's happening. We've got to take that first step, and then we'll feel that breeze behind us, and it'll begin to take us. And we'll go here, and we'll go there, 
and things will begin to happen and God's will will be accomplished. But it's as we, it's as we are obedient to that voice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The rest of that verse says, by the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst favor unto them. The favor of God is with Joseph. It took him from the pit to Potiphar's house, and he became the, the head guy in Potiphar's house. Then we got light on, he went to prison, but he became the head guy at the prison. And within two years, he was a head guy in, because God's favor was upon him. When we have the favor of God with us, even if we're in the prison, we're still in a good place because we're about to hit advancement. And we think it looks like prison to me. And it was, it was very hard. There was rats, it wasn't watching TV. It was, it was a prison over there and that's, that's rough. But God was with him and his countenance was, it means his face was shining upon him. And even though he was wondering what day it was, if God was even up there, he had a promise over his life and he knew that God was faithful. And in all the Bible, you never hear where Joseph griped one time. He just kept a positive attitude and just kept going. And one day, the word that was given to him came to full fruition. And he was put as second in command of Pharaoh. And his brothers came and bowed to him. His father came and bowed to him to get grain. God is faithful. What God has promised you, the Bible says he is able also to perform it he said for what is too hard for God there's nothing impossible with God we just have to be faithful we cannot be like Debbie says we cannot be of those that turn back into perdition we have to step forward we have to keep on stepping we have to keep on plugging Job says though he slay me yet will I trust him we've got to have that tenacity just to keep going like that one guy says, he says, when you finally get stopped where you can't go anymore, if you're going to fall, fall forward. Yeah. I thought that was, that's a pretty good thing. Just keep, take that left step. And as you're falling, just fall across the finish line. Yeah. Okay. But it's that tenacity that God is looking for. It's that can do spirit with God. All things are possible. Hallelujah. Amen. If you will rise with me, we will do our offering declarations. And once again, we declare over our offering, not as rote memorization, although some of us have memorized it by rote. But they talked about if you want tomatoes, you plant a tomato seed. And if you want potatoes, you plant a potato seed. A potato what has a seeds in it. And if you want cucumbers, you plant a ziki. What kind of a seed do you plant if you want a cucumber? Zeke says you plant a cucumber seed. Okay. So the principle is that as we, as we have a need and we say, Lord, I need a car and I'm, I'm going to get a car seed. Now this is a point of contact, but you know, we have to have something to hook our faith to. So we say, Lord, I'm believing for a car. You know you've promised me a new car, and I'm believing for it. I'm believing for it. So I'm just going to believe that this is a seed to my car or to my house or to my son coming home getting off drugs. Whatever you're believing for, name, name your seed. Because what you're doing is you're believing, and you're, it's like a point of contact. You're believing, just like that lady said, if, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. I know I will be whole. Well, when she touched it, boom, it, Jesus was like, what happened? Because it just, it shorted him out. And she's like, 
you know, she, she fell down. She thought she was in trouble. And he says, You're, it's all good. Your faith has made you whole. But she said in her heart, if I can just do blank, fill in the blanks. And this is the blank. Okay, when you name your seed, you're putting it in the offering and you're saying, Lord, this is my tomato. I want a tomato plant. This is my cucumber. I want a cucumber. When you name your seed, it's not just, as, as they would say, throwing money in a bucket. Because that doesn't do any good for anybody. But if you have that point of contact and you say, Lord, see this? This is for you fill in the blanks. So, Father, this is for full blessing for spirit of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good preaching, Brother Trail. All right. As we are receiving today's offering, we are believing the Lord for blessings to overtake us. Jobs, raises, and bonuses. Benefits, sales, and commissions. Favorable settlements. Checks in the mail. Gifts and surprises. Debts paid off. Bank accounts full. Protection for us and our families. Protection for our houses, vehicles, and possessions, health and healing, a long, strong life, signs, wonders, and miracles, anointings, giftings, and callings, open heavens, open doors, and divine appointments, dreams, visions, and angelic visitations, new people saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and discipled to follow the Lord. Thank you, Father that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower me with favor, blessings, and increase so that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 I'll tell you something about that. Two or three days ago, we had gotten behind on our car payment. And... And this is off the record, even though it's on the record. But they were coming to get my car. Because we didn't have money to pay for our car. And when I finally called them and was able to make, make arrangements with them, we'll just say that. Um, they said, well, that's good, because on Wednesday, the repo man was sent out to your house. And this was on Saturday that I called him. So that he had been circling for two to three days. And we were all concerned about our vehicles. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. Don't, don't raise your hand. But you probably, some of you probably know a little bit about what we're talking about. All right. Anyway, so when I told Debbie that, she's like, yeah. And when we do our offering declarations, we believe for protection for our vehicles. I'm like, right. Good point. <laughs> Anyway, God is faithful, and he takes us through and watches over us in all of our ways. We don't know what we need to watch out for sometimes, but God knows the end from the beginning, and he will keep track of us and keep the wolves at bay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's, let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time together. We ask you, Father God, that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see, and a heart to understand. Let us not be forgetful hearers, but let us be a doer of the work. For God, we know that as, as we do the work, Father God, we are blessed in our deed. So Father God, let us walk forward. Encourage those, Father God, that are trying to make a step but are hesitant. Let them get it over with and just make that step. Yes. And Father God, I pray that you would be faithful and that you would bless them in their action. In Jesus' name, amen. And before you leave, can I just jump in here a half a second and then you can all praise, all honor and glory go to the Father. And but I just want to say, Marilyn and I just love Steve and Debbie. And show them, tell them, pour out your love to them, give them a hug, hug their neck. And I you, you guys do that anyway. And you're don't stand there and say, What's he talking about? I do that anyway. You don't do anything, Fatso. And so so but just tell him you love him. I'm blown away by this place. Amen. I've been been coming here a year and I'm going, I mean, there's nowhere else like this that I know of. And if you know us somewhere, you know, I'm telling the truth. 
So pour it out on them. Pour out your love to them. And I know you do, but do it more, more. Amen. And give all glory to God. Because it's all God. It's definitely all God. A quick announcement. Next weekend is Ian Johnson. You need to register beforehand because it's $40 ahead of schedule. It's $50 at the door. For those who say, I want to come just one, one service, I think it's, I don't know where, I think it's $10 a service. Is it $10 a service? Okay, so if you just want to come to one or two, it's $10 a service, but it's uh, $40 pre-registration, $50 at the door. And, and then if, if, you're re if you're volunteering, don't register online. Go see Miss Laura because volunteers will get a discount. Okay, cool? So be sure and you want to do that. And then there's other ones coming, so be sure and, and um, get online and look. Yes? Okay. Be blessed.